Thank you. So glad you're here on this uh, Easter Sunday, and uh, we pray that the Lord will uh, bless you and uh, encourage you as we spend these next few moments together. I know every time that we come together on Sundays like Easter and Christmas, uh, that we have folks here that don't uh, come perhaps that often, and so the last thing you know, they want is for uh, this to be a, a really long sermon, and it won't be, I promise you that. Isn't that good news? When you preach on Easter, you don't have to clap, but I appreciate your enthusiasm. When you preach on Easter, you have to kind of be like the rooster, what he told the hen who was going to lay the egg on the middle of the highway. He said, two pieces of advice, do what you got to do and do it quickly. And that's really where we are this morning. We've got to do what we've got to do and do it quickly. So let's uh, get into what we're doing. I think we may have lost our screen for a moment, so let me just go ahead and begin here. We have been, over the last five weeks, in a series of messages called Faces of the Cross. And in the midst of what we've been doing, we've been trying to understand about the people who were most intricately involved in the life of Jesus in those last 24 hours. And we took those lives and we extrapolated from what happened to them how it has meaning and how it has purpose for us today. We started with the life of Judas Iscariot. And we looked at the life of Judas Iscariot and we saw there at that face around the cross a face of remorse and a face of regret. And we talked about what remorse and regret do to people's lives. And then after that we looked at the life of Pontius Pilate. We talked about the face of a people pleaser. We talked about all the mistakes that Pontius Pilate made because he didn't have the courage to do the right thing. He was more concerned in protecting his own stature and his own job. And we looked after that at the face of Simon Peter. We saw the face of failure. A man who had said to Jesus just 24 hours earlier, though everyone else might fail you, though everyone else might go away from you, I, Lord, never will. And then he did the very thing, almost, that Judas did. And then last week we looked at the face of Barabbas, the man that Pilate released instead of releasing Jesus. And at the face of Barabbas, we see our face on the cross. We see my face there on the cross of Jesus. Today, we're going to close out this series and make it relate to what is happening across the world at Easter. I want to talk about Thomas and the face of doubt. Because when you come to Easter, what you're really looking at is this story about whether you can truly believe that Jesus is resurrected. I want to pick the reading up in the 20th chapter of John. If you have your Bible, you can find it there. Let me also tell you that it's on the screen. You can follow what John wrote there. He says, on the evening of the first day of the week. Now what John's writing about is on that resurrection Sunday, on that Sunday morning, Jesus was no longer in the grave. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, the disciples thought they've taken Jesus, arrested him, beaten him, killed him, and they're coming after us next. They're hiding out, and they're frightened, and they're behind closed and locked doors. And all of a sudden, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. I want you to imagine what that must have felt like. Now, Thomas, who we're talking about today, one of the twelve disciples. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, the side where the Roman centurion had ran the spear, I will not believe. Now, what Thomas reflected is what many people in the world today reflect today. They just really don't believe in miracles, and they certainly don't believe in this miracle. And when you come to our Christian faith, you really have to come down on this question of, do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in miracles occur? Because in the life of Jesus, there's two great miracles. The Bible says you have to believe one at the beginning of his life and the other at the end. On the beginning that he was born of a virgin woman. That she was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by human form. That Jesus came forth, born as a perfect man. 100% human, but 100% divine. 
The greater miracle is at the end of his life that he died and was resurrected. Do you believe in miracles? That's the real question today. And people say, well, I don't know. I guess I believe that life itself is a miracle, and it is. If you've ever seen a new baby, if you've seen that newborn, if you've been there at that hospital, if you've been around that, it's one of the most incredible things in the world. And some people say, well, yeah, I guess that's the miracle I believe in. Other people, the only kind of miracles they believe in happen in sports. Yesterday, Wichita State shocks, the shocker shock. Ohio State Buckeyes and knock them out. Now they're going to the Sweet 16. But is there any other kind of miracle? Some people live their lives financially saying not only do I believe in miracles, I depend on them every month to get my bills paid. Well, you know, that's not really any of those the real definition of a miracle. Miracles are something that are unique and they are unlike anything else that happens in life. There's three qualities of a miracle. Number one, it doesn't happen every day. Sometimes it only happens one time. Second of all, the miracle is always hard to believe. And third of all, miracles simply cannot be explained away. You can try, but it doesn't change the fact that a miracle occurred. And when we come to Easter, when we come to the resurrection, when we come to the empty tomb, we have the greatest miracle of all that ever occurred, and we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe it? It's kind of an interesting if you think about it. Nobody has a problem believing that Jesus died. And the reason we know that is that people wear silver crosses around their neck all the time, symbolizing, connecting themselves that Jesus died. But you hardly ever see anybody wearing a little silver tomb around their neck. You ever notice that? There's a new fashion. There's a niche for you if you're a designer. That's what we ought to be wearing, not a silver cross, but a silver tomb representing that it's empty and that Jesus has been resurrected. Do you believe in miracles? If you say, well, I'm not sure. You're in good company. There were people that were there at the cross that still weren't sure if it was true. And nobody represents doubt in all the Bible like Thomas. A man who says, I'm simply not going to believe it unless I see it myself. Now I want to talk to you about doubt today. I want to talk to you about that doubt isn't necessarily a bad thing. And that if someone is a doubter, it doesn't make them a bad person. In fact, it makes them a rather intelligent person. It makes them a rather inquisitive person. It makes them a rather intuitive person to say, I need to find out if this really is true. And that's Thomas. Now, what do we know about Thomas? Not a whole lot, but we know a little bit about him. He's called Didymus in the Bible. Didymus is simply a word that means twin. So Thomas had a twin. He had a twin brother or he had a twin sister. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say it's been speculated through the years that Matthew, the other disciple, might have been the twin brother of Thomas. But we really don't know. Did you know we get the word ditto from Didymus? It comes from that Greek language. Ditto means the same thing. That's where that comes from. Well, what does the face of a doubter look like? In the next few minutes, I want to show you how every time we come together, we take God's Word and we make it authentic and we make it relevant. This is not a history lesson today. This is God's Word applied to our lives for right now. Now, maybe this morning you have some doubt. You might have deep, deep down doubt whether the resurrection really is true. You may have doubt about the presence of God. You may have doubt about the reality of God. You may have doubt about God caring or loving or being able or willing to be involved in whatever you're going through right now. Well, hang on. Let me talk to you about what we can see in the face of Thomas about doubters. What does the face of a doubter look like? Well, two or three things. We have this story earlier on in John 11 where Lazarus, the good friend of Jesus, has died. And Jesus had gotten the word that Lazarus was sick, and they said, Jesus, please come, because we know you can heal Lazarus, but they don't go. In fact, Jesus waits four days, and by the time he gets the word and gets there, Lazarus has long been dead, and he's in the tomb. And then Jesus says to the disciples, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I wasn't there so that you're going to believe, but now let us go to him. And there's this interesting comment by Thomas, also known as Didymus. He says to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now what's he talking about? 
For Jesus at that stage near the end of the life, near the time of the cross, for Him to go back to Jerusalem meant that the people who are looking for Him and trying to kill Him, if you go back there, they're going to get you, Jesus. Which is actually what happened. And so Thomas says, hey, if the Lord's going, we've got to go too. Now some people look at that verse and they see Thomas as this defeatist, as this guy who just you know, doesn't have any hope, who's a pessimist, he goes, look, they're going to kill Jesus, we might as well go. That's not really how that word and that sentence happens in the original language. What Thomas really says, if they're going to kill Jesus, we're going, because they're going to have to kill us first. Or at least Thomas is saying, they're going to have to kill me first. You see, doubters are not cowards. (coughs) Doubters are not cowards, and Thomas is no coward. It takes courage to confront the truth. It does. It takes courage to not just say, well, everybody else says it's true. I guess I'll believe it. It takes courage to say, well, I'm not just going to accept Christianity because my parents did or my grandparents did. I'm not just going to accept Christianity because that's what my friends do or my neighborhood does. That's what my culture does. It takes courage to confront the truth. James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Isn't that good? There's your faith crisis. You're not sure about the cross. You're not sure about the resurrection. You're not sure about the power of God. Nothing that is not faced can be changed. You have to confront it. And that's what Thomas does here. The face of Thomas is a face that's not a doubter. And the face of a doubter is also an independent thinker. Doesn't believe in group think. Doesn't do it just because everybody else does it. It's the night before the cross. They're at the upper room, what we call the Lord's Supper. And Jesus is trying here in chapter 14 of John to get these guys to understand what's about to happen in the next few hours. And John 14 is one of the most comforting passages of the Bible. And Jesus says that I'm about to go away. And in my Father's house are many rooms. He has prepared them for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you myself that where I am, You may be also there. We use that a lot of time in Christian funerals to say that the Lord's prepared a place for us. So Jesus says that I have prepared a place for you guys and I'm going to bring you to where I am and you know the play to the place that I'm going. Now the disciples are sitting there and they're going, what is he saying? What's he talking about? What is this all about? But only one guy has the willingness to ask the question everybody's thinking. Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And that question prompts one of the most famous verses that Jesus ever says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I and the Father am one. And Jesus says, if you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Maybe the greatest revelation at that point that Jesus has made about himself You've seen me, Thomas. You've seen the Father. I have revealed myself. I am who has always been. Now, Thomas is the only guy who has the courage to ask the question that nobody else will ask. Lord, we're not even sure what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going. How are we going to find it? How do we know the place? How do we know the way? You see, a doubter is an independent thinker. A doubter may be an independent thinker, but I want you to hear this but he always keeps an open mind to the truth. Now some people confuse doubt with skeptics. Some people confuse doubt with cynics. You see, if you're a skeptic or cynic, you refuse to examine truth. If you're a skeptic or a cynic, you refuse to be open to any view except the view that it can't be true. One of the greatest examples of a skeptic and cynic is the guy who grew up in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And he heard word that the Wright brothers had come back to invent the airplane. And he said three famous things. Number one, man is never going to fly. Number two, man will never fly in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And number three, if man does fly in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, it sure won't be the Wright brothers who do it. (laughs) Well, you know, some people are just wrong. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Right? Some people take a lot of pride 
because they're such a skeptic and they're such a cynic. And that's not what Thomas was. You see, Thomas misses the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. We don't know why. We don't know where he was. We don't know why he didn't make it. But he's not there. And he says, I'm not going to believe he was there until I see it for myself. Unless I can put my hands into the scars in his hand and in his side where the spear pierced him, I'm not going to believe it. And he listened to me this morning. Thomas is not a heretic for questioning, and you're not either. That doesn't make you a heretic. The good news is, in this story, Jesus has no problem providing proof to sincere doubters. When he sees Thomas a week later, he says, calls him out. Thomas, come here. I want you to put your finger right here. I want you to look at my hands. And I want you to put your hand into my side. That's how deep that wound was. All of Thomas's hand would fit in there. Now, Thomas, I want you to stop doubting and I want you to believe. And that's the word of Jesus at Easter. The tomb says, look inside. The empty tomb says, come on in and examine. The empty tomb says, it's okay to have doubt, but don't have a closed mind. Don't refuse to examine the facts. Now listen, there is plenty of room for people to question the resurrection story. But you haven't done what you need to do if you don't look at the facts, if you don't look at the evidence. And there's all kinds of proof. First thing you have is the proof Jesus really did die. You have hundreds, maybe thousands of people who were there at the cross who heard him cry out, Lord, it is finished, and hung his head and died. People saw it. People were there. There wasn't any question. But in case anyone ever doubted the Roman centurion who was trying to hasten the process because the Passover was drawing near, people used to hang on a cross sometimes three, four, five days, die the most agonizing death. Jesus has only been there a few hours. And the Bible says that the Roman centurion takes a sword and he runs it up the ribcage of Jesus and he rips through the cartilages and he breaks open into the sack there where the lungs and the heart are contained. And the Bible says all the blood and all the water and all the fluids of his body, they fall down on the ground. Let me tell you about Roman centurions. They were the best of the best if you were the centurion and you were charged with being sure a man was dead, you didn't fail. All these silly ideas that Jesus swooned on the cross, that Jesus just fainted on the cross. Roman soldiers don't make those kinds of mistakes. You've got a dead Savior. There isn't any question about it. Second thing you've got is the tomb of Jesus. The tomb of Jesus wasn't even his, belonged to Jesus of Arimathea. And those days... You were buried in the side of a rock formation, limestone rock. Where I come from in Texas, lots of limestone, a very, very hard, sturdy rock. And it was carved out, and you cut into it, and it made a kind of a horseshoe, but there's no exit. There's no access on the other side. This is what the tomb of Jesus today, people believe that it's been found. That's what it looks like, just a carved out piece of a rock. And there's no way to escape it. And there's no way to get out of it. And the women come and they prepare the body of Jesus. And they wrap it after they cover it in the spices. And they wrap, first of all, a three-piece outfit. First of all, around his legs and his feet. Totally sealed it up. And then a second piece around his trunk all the way up to his neck. And they seal it up. And then all around the head and they seal it up. And the spices, they dry out and the body stays there. It mummifies the body. Jesus is in a tomb and he's dead. And he's covered in grave clothes. And then there's the rock. The rock that seals the tomb. In those days you built the tomb a little bit on the incline. And when you got ready to be finished you took a large rock and the, and the carpenters there would build a a form there that would keep the rock from falling back. And when the body's in there and everything is finished, then that form is removed and the gravity pushes the rock down and seals the tomb. About a 3,000 pound rock. Now, ordinary man, Superman, doesn't move that rock. 
Not a man who's dead. Not a man who's been had his body prepared for burial. Not a man who's been wrapped in cloth, sealed with maybe 20 to 30 pounds of spices. He's sealed in that tomb. He's dead. He's in his burial clothes. On top of that, his tomb is guarded. The Jewish officials go back to Pilate and they say, there's been this speculation that they're going to say he's back alive again. We want a guard of the Roman soldiers to guard his tomb at night. And Pilate, you know, is like, he's just had it with these guys. He says, fine. He sends a guard of 16 elite Roman soldiers. They patrol four hours at a time, four men. Roman soldiers don't desert. Do you know what the penalty among Roman soldiers was for abandoning your post? They burned you alive in your clothes. Pretty good incentive to stay at your post. Yet in the middle of the night, the Bible says, when the angel appeared, the next morning the soldiers are gone. And then you get down to all these eyewitnesses' accounts. For example, the showing up of Jesus in a locked room where nobody knows where they're hiding and Jesus is there. And he talks to the disciples. The same day, he's on the road to Emmaus and he sees two men. He walks with them, goes home, has dinner with them and explains what had just happened and then they realize it's the Lord. He sees Mary that morning at the tomb, Mary Magdalene, and says, Mary, it's me, it's Jesus. Tell disciples I'll meet them. And then there's that fateful encounter with Thomas. He says, Thomas, I understand you're doubting. So put your hands in my hands. Fill the scars, Thomas, where the nails were. Put your hand inside my side. It'll fit in there, Thomas. That's where they stuck me with the sword or with the spear. He goes up to Galilee and he finds Peter fishing. Cooks breakfast for him. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15... He even one day meets with more than 500 people, followers of his, who see him, listen to him, and engage with him. When Josh McDowell wrote the book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, he estimated that if this were a trial to prove that Jesus indeed is resurrected, the eyewitness testimony alone would be more than 120 hours of testimony. We make decisions on cases on one eyewitness. It's very hard to refute eyewitness testimony if you know anything about the legal system. The one thing you can't argue against is someone who saw it with their own eyes. You have over 500 people, eyewitness testimony, that they saw the resurrected Jesus. But then you go to the courage of the disciples when Jesus goes back to heaven. You remember those disciples that are hiding in a locked room that nobody knows where they are because they're afraid the Jewish officials will find them. After Jesus returns to heaven, those men go right in Jerusalem and start preaching. They go right to the temple and they start preaching that Jesus is not dead but alive. If he's still in the tomb, if he's still dead, all they've got to do is take them out to the grave and open it up and say, look, he's still dead but the tomb is empty. You can't refute that. They're preaching there in Jerusalem and Peter and John are warned, stop preaching by the men who killed Jesus. And when they don't stop preaching, then they hold them and they flog them the way they flogged Jesus. And the Bible says that when they left there after being flogged, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. People don't do that for a myth. People don't do that for an illusion. People don't do that for a ruse. People don't do that for pulling the wool over somebody else's eyes. They preach and they teach because they know Jesus is alive. I'll tell you one more thing. There are 48 major Old Testament prophecies about the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. 48. You know how many of them come true? All 48. Written hundreds and thousands of years before he ever is born. A mathematician looked at the odds of 48 predictions all coming true. You know what he said it's equivalent to? It's equivalent to a woman being on a boat in the ocean and the diamond ring that her husband gives to her 
slips off of her finger and falls down into the ocean and sinks to the bottom of the sea. And a guy goes out to find her ring. But he's not told what ocean she lost her ring in. Not told if it's the Atlantic, it's the Pacific, it's the Indian, it's the Antarctic Ocean. It's just in the ocean. The likelihood of all 48 prophecies coming true are as likely as a guy getting a boat and not knowing what ocean that ring is lost in and finding that ring. That's the power of the proof of the resurrection of Jesus. What do we draw from this? The same thing that Jesus said to Thomas, he says to you and me today. If you're not a believer, stop doubting and believe, not just because it's the right thing to do, because the evidence and the proof is there. If you're already a believer, stop doubting that he can help you with what you've got to go through. Stop doubting that he has enough power to help you. Stop doubting that he has enough love to help you. If he loved you enough for Jesus to die on the cross, if he has power enough to raise his son from the dead, he has enough power to get you through what you're going through and enough love to help you and sustain you through whatever crisis you are facing today. The greatest doubters become to be the greatest believers. You know what the tradition is of Thomas? That after being proven the resurrection of Jesus is true, they became to be a missionary and took the gospel all the way to India. Now India, as you know, is a country that would not be considered a Christian country. But there's one thing about India you can't be explained away. In the southernmost part of India, there is a province that's totally Christian. There's even a mountain called St. Thomas. Thomas spent the rest of his life dedicated to saying, I was the biggest doubter, and now I'm the greatest of all the believers. That's a flag of Switzerland. We know the Swiss for two or three things. Great chocolate, great scenery, great banks. Do you know the other thing we know about the Swiss? Neutrality. They never get involved. They never make decisions. They just say we're neutral. You can't be Switzerland about the resurrection. You either believe or you don't. And to not make a choice is to choose not to believe. And someday, we all stand before God according to scripture, and we'll give an account for our lives. And the one thing Jesus is going to want to know, did you believe me or not? You can't go up and say, well, God, I'm Switzerland. <laughs> not that I didn't believe in you, I just stayed neutral. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Either you believe me or you didn't. It's okay to be a doubter. But doubters are willing to look at the evidence. They're willing to examine it just like Thomas did. You've got to look at the empty tomb and say, what is the answer? Do I believe? Do I believe in the miracles? Do I believe when God's word said he has risen just as he said? I'll tell you this story and I'll be through. The story comes out of Africa about a Muslim man who converted to faith in Jesus Christ. They asked him, why did you leave being a Muslim and become to be a Christian? And he said, because I realized life is going down a road and the road diverges. I could go one of two directions. And where the road forked, I saw two men. One dead, and the other alive. He said, who would you ask which way to go? The dead man or the alive man? That's it. He said, well, there are other great religious leaders. There are. But none of them make the claim that Jesus Christ makes. 
only those of us who follow him stand and say we serve a risen Savior today who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray together.